Hello and welcome to Move Conversations. This is your host Venkat. In this edition of Move Conversations, I talk to Professor George Day, co-author of the book See Sooner, Act Faster: How Vigilant Leaders Thrive in an Era of Digital Turbulence. He wrote the book with Professor Paul Schumacher. Professor George Day is Jeffrey T. Boise Professor Emeritus at the Wharton School of University of Pennsylvania. He founded the Mac Institute for Innovation Management at the Wharton School, where he is presently faculty emeritus in residence. He was previously the executive director of the Marketing Science Institute. In 2015, he was chosen as one of the 11 legends in marketing. And 2020, he was awarded the Shet Medal, a biannual award for exceptional contribution to marketing scholarship and practice. I've been a fan of Professor Day's books for over two decades. During the dot-com boom, I read his book, Managing Emerging Technologies, to make sense of what was going on then. Later, I read his book, Peripheral Vision, which he also wrote with Professor Schumacher. A couple of years back, I used his book, Strategy from Outside In, Profiting from Customer Value, to teach an executive master's course in Murdoch University. That's when I got in touch with Professor Day. Again, this year I plan to teach that strategy course with his new book, See Sooner, Act Faster. So it's truly an honor for me to interview Professor Day. Welcome to the show. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and it is a treat to be uh, included. And uh, I really uh, appreciate your interest in the evolving work uh, that uh, has led uh, to uh, the See Sooner, Act Faster book. But it's a part of a bigger uh, inquiry into how organizations better prepare themselves for an era of increasing turbulence. Now, in the book, we focused on digital turbulence which is certainly uh, uh, ever present and accelerating. But uh, there are many forces acting on all organizations. We can't possibly contend with all of them, but uh, the basic premise behind the book is if you understand and appreciate the weak signals of a threat or an opportunity, you're much better prepared uh, to take action because you have understood it, you've taken some uh, preliminary steps to uh, try to uh, address it. And so when the, uh, the time is right, when the market is right, uh, when the regulators uh, uh, descend on you, you're better prepared and uh, uh, can act faster than your rivals. So this is all benchmarked against uh, you, the, the competitive set. So, so that's a, that's a great intro to, to the book. So, but for the, uh, you know, audiences who, some of whom may not be so familiar with the book, if you could sort of step back and a little bit and uh, set the context first, uh, to, and begin with what is, uh, you know, outside in thinking and how is a better way to create value for the customer yeah. and the company collaborators, stakeholders, yeah. everybody, and then we will come to, to these, uh, current topics. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take a little step back, uh, Venkat, uh, yes. and describe how <clears throat> Paul Schumacher and I collaborate. He comes out of uh, decision sciences. He was a uh, principal in the Shell uh, oil uh, initial exploration of scenario planning. So he He's is a, a master in dealing with uncertainty. I bring a marketing and a marketing strategy perspective. Uh, and that's where the outside in <clears throat> comes from. Uh, and, and, and fundamentally, uh, it's, it's rooted in the marketing concept, which has defined the field for uh, over 30 years. Uh, and it says, in effect, uh, to understand your strategy and the threats and opportunities, you have to stand outside the organization in the shoes of the customers, the competitors, uh, uh, 
and 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 particularly now your partners and uh, see the uh, see your organization through their eyes, and uh, that is uh, demonstrably uh, a different perspective than uh, most organizations take, where they start from the inside out and they say, <clears throat> "Well, we have these resources." How might we use them better? How can we cut costs? And 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 uh, I want to emphasize these are critical questions, but uh, they frame the inquiry too narrowly, and so the, uh, the the problem of inside out thinking isn't that uh, we don't have to uh, <coughs> leverage technologies. It's just that it sets the frame uh, far too narrowly, and uh, we then are insensitive to the risk of uh, uh, potential rivals coming in using, and, and this is where digital turbulence really creates a lot of, uh, of issues for companies because it is an entryway for new companies to come into your market or for you right. to go into their market. But uh, right. it requires standing back and, uh, uh, and particularly uh, uh, being rooted in marketing, I tend to look at companies through the eyes of the customers. Absolutely. And, uh, so a, a good example uh, would be the, uh, the, the, the process that uh, Amazon uses, mm -hmm. which is, uh, has its aspiration uh, as, as uh, been articulated throughout the company to be the world's most customer-centric organization. And right. uh, they have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they have an uh, approach to innovation that I think is very revealing uh, of the outside-in perspective. And they call it uh, uh, the working backwards process. Correct, um, right. Uh, if you're listeners are not familiar with it, working backwards says uh, we basically have to look at the world through our prospective customer's eyes. So if we're innovating, the first thing we have to do is write a press release, a future press release that describes the value proposition we're delivering to the customer. So imagine uh, the the uh, team leader, the uh, innovator who has the uh, concept um, and what he has to do or she has to do is define it in such a way is that it's offering a compelling value proposition. It's framed against our other alternatives. And uh, then uh, it's backstopped by a uh, set of frequently asked questions which are co-created with the leaders. And right. uh, the reason I'm spending a little time on that is that it, it really has worked extraordinarily well for Amazon. And, uh, and it does uh, uh, emphasize the value proposition. And uh, uh, Amazon is prone to create a value proposition and then figure out what kinds of technologies are needed and then acquire the technologies they need to put it into place. Uh, now I'm gonna contrast that with the uh, stage gate process, which uh, in theory should be outside in, but in practice, practice. Uh, the concept statement describes the features, mm. not the benefits, it describes the, uh, the technologies we're going to use, how we're going to leverage our capabilities. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's the beginning of the process. It's already inside out. And Correct. so uh, the, uh, the, the forcing function of the working backwards uh, demands that you think like a customer uh, right. and you articulate the value proposition and and, and I mean, I'm glad that, and I'm glad that you brought out the 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 you know how 
<clears throat> stage gate process is looking at it from from inside yes. the organization so so and and i think you have been articulating over many years about this particular issue in the sense that hey this is causing short sightedness tunnel vision right. uh, you know and uh, you know and this is not keeping the company is looking out on the periphery and spot developments yeah. out there exactly. so so, you know, one of the interesting examples I also came across in your book was that you highlighted how Indian pharmaceutical companies developed low-cost AIDS and generic, uh, you know, exactly. drugs yeah. for Africa and so on. Yeah. So could you elaborate about this uh, peripheral vision and, you know, looking at things on the periphery and so on? Uh, the importance. So let, let me link that back <coughs> to the, uh, the, the concepts we were talking about, about working backwards. <coughs> Um, and, and I'm going to have to back up even a little further and describe why we started in on the, uh, the work on peripheral vision. And mm -hmm. that led, uh, this was done 10 years ago. Um, right. Academics uh, take their time. Um, and, <laughs> no, but it's uh, super so, relevant today, right? It, yeah. is, it is prophetic, yeah. right? What you said that time. So we, uh, we, we started to get... Uh, uh, into the topic of peripheral vision, which is, uh, and, and we use the uh, metaphor, the, uh, the, the vision metaphor, very mindfully, because uh, the periphery of the organization, as in the periphery of, uh, of our vision, is all of the weak signals way out in the fuzzy zone at the edge of our vision, and uh, at the edge of the organization. So uh, the periphery includes uh, not only uh, regulators, uh, but uh, uh, our, our people in uh, uh, remote uh, regions uh, who perhaps have a better insight into what's happening with say competitors. But uh, right. the, the, the point of peripheral vision is that <clears throat> it's about detecting the early warning signs and then following through on the most significant and interesting ones uh, to explore them further. And that led uh, to our uh, exploration of, okay, what can you do uh, that will minimize the investment uh, in, in time and energy uh, and still get better prepared. And that's what led to the uh, See Sooner Act Faster book. But the right. idea of uh, peripheral vision is uh, simply that uh, uh, we want to uh, set out and, and uh, demonstrate curiosity about what's happening in our, in our periphery. And so the... Uh, the uh, the, the, the point of uh, uh, being able to understand a weak signal is, is that eventually that weak signal will uh, become highly visible to everyone. <laughs> and and it's, yeah, uh, the, the, the consequences of cloud computing or blockchain or uh, other technologies or societal trends, that right. will become abundantly apparent. But by then, everybody knows it, and there's yeah. not an opportunity. Now, here's the, uh, the, the challenge we face, and it's a challenge we all live with, <clears throat> and that is that uh, the number of weak signals from the periphery is uh, uh, increasing at an exponential rate. Uh, right. and, and, and so uh, not only is that happening, but the signal to noise ratio is deteriorating. That is uh, the useful uh, signal <laughs> to the amount of uh, noisy, cluttered, uh, confusing information. Uh, and, and, and so it is very, very hard uh, to avoid being overwhelmed and uh, so much of the book on peripheral vision, if I could go back to that now, was about uh, sorting through all of the noise to detect the things 
the weak signals that will be of most influence in your organization. And uh, <clears throat> so we came up with the uh, uh, concept. And, and uh, when I say came up with, this is a collaborative exercise. The way Paul and I work is that we come up with a concept, then we try it out on our clients. And right. so uh, our, uh, our, our clients are really our test bed. And uh, right. so we go out, work with organizations. Uh, Paul uh, uh, runs uh, Decision Strategies International, uh, which is a very large uh, futures consulting firm. I have my own clients and uh, we learn an enormous amount from them. But the, uh, what, what we were concerned about and uh, is an increasing concern is the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, things coming at all organizations. So the approach we used was to devise a set of uh, guiding questions that are continuously modified. But a guiding question is a few pivotal questions that right. are, are, are sent around the organizations. Oh, okay, we got to watch this technology. Uh, we have to be very close to uh, this changing regulatory scene. Um, and uh, and by the way, uh, uh, <laughs> one of the most interesting areas was uh, that uh, sometimes the uh, the most important weak signals come from within the organization. So mm -hmm. in the evolution uh, from peripheral vision 10 years ago to the present, uh, our clients have been blindsided, surprised more often by problems from within the organization. And I'm talking about uh, latent corruption, sexual harassment, uh, and uh, malfeasance. Uh, uh, mis misaligned uh, incentives. Uh, and, and these are the problems that uh, consume a lot of management time. Now, there are uh, organizations that are far better at detecting those kinds of internal problems and facing up to them very fast. And, right. and that's what we call a vigilant organization. True, true. And, uh, you know, um, uh, you know the, in your current book, a recent book, you also in from an external periphery context, uh, I found that your discussion and uh, of the chocolate industry was very interesting. And, yeah. uh, and uh, could you describe it briefly, some of the key points uh, to our viewers, because, you know, most of them can definitely relate to the to the to the example. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there is a rich <laughs> uh, a chocolate rich story behind that. Uh, okay. As it turned out, uh, uh, and I, I can't name the two companies. Uh, I understand. But uh, Paul was consulting for one major chocolate manufacturer. It's an extremely well known global company. And right. I was consulting with another one. <laughs> and uh, we, we realized this. Uh, uh, Oh, about three years ago. So we came up with a, and, and we, we, we told our clients about this because we didn't want to uh, uh, surprise them uh, mm -hmm. and we needed to get their permission. So we right. put together a composite of uh, all of the uh, zones of the weak signals that we thought they should be watching. And okay. uh, so if, if fortunately the two chocolate companies were in different zones of the confectionery industry and so right. they were not directly competing and they right. thought that was wonderful and uh <laughs> so uh the portion that we were able to publish because there's some of it is very sensitive uh right. is that's which they could say yeah uh go ahead we, we, we this is public information with you positioning that uh so <clears throat> the um the, the, the kinds of uh, roughly 15 or 20 different zones of uncertainty. 
And right. I'm in, introducing a, a, a slightly different concept. Uncertainty means that we can't even set a probability. That is, uh, the, uh, the future is uh, essentially, there's many possibilities. And we have no idea which one is going to emerge. But uh, let's take a uh, particularly uh, important one back three years ago. And that mm -hmm. is that uh, one of these companies uh, uh, in particular uh, mm. depended heavily on hazelnuts in right. their production. And right. there's one country, which is Turkey, that produces 80% of all the hazelnuts. <laughs> Correct. Well, uh, <laughs> it, it, three years ago, we had the Syrian war, uh, turmoil in the Middle East, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the uncertainty was, well, how secure is that supply? But uh, mm -hmm. they were looking at all sorts of uh, issues uh, and, 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 and focusing on them. These were sort of their guiding questions. Uh, <clears throat> what can we do with, uh, say, uh, a blockchain to mm -hmm. trace um, uh, Origins. the... Uh, the cocoa beans all the way through because they yeah. had no way of tracking cocoa beans from their origin to the uh, the production plant. Okay. Okay. Uh, and and uh, there were also interesting uh, opportunities in personalized chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so by a personalized chocolate, you make your own. It, it, you, your wives, uh, I'm sure, have, uh, as mine has, uh, 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 gone to a perfume factory and uh, designed their own perfume. Well, mm -hmm. the concept here is you design your own chocolate uh, right. exactly to your uh, taste. And, and so this is an illustration uh, all the way from geopolitics to extraordinary personalization that is enabled by the advances in technology. Uh, right. So uh, that suggests the, uh, the breadth of, uh, uh, the, the, of scanning by a vigilant organization. Now, let me just take a uh, moment to talk about the vulnerable organizations mm -hmm. by contrast. Sure, sure. Vigilant organization, is I, I would say these two chocolate companies because right. they were both watching in their own way uh, these zones of uncertainty mm -hmm. and trying to get ahead of them. Um, mm -hmm. In our work, uh, in our uh, research, which is underpinning the book, uh, is, is that we surveyed um, and, and, and uh, interviewed uh, rather about 25 major companies. Mm -hmm. And then we surveyed another 120. Um, and and uh, briefly, what we found is that if you array um, uh, along a, uh, a horizontal dimension where the vigilant organizations, the ones that see sooner and are able to act faster, uh, there's about 20% of them at the end of the, uh, the spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. At the other end of the spectrum are the vulnerable ones who are continually being surprised and having to react. Now, the, the problem with reacting is that you don't have any degrees of freedom. Uh, Correct. You're constrained. Uh, and uh, so... The, the best talent is not available by the time you uh, take action. So uh, at any rate, about 20% of companies are vigilant in our uh, definition. 35% are vulnerable. That is, they're constantly reacting and they're very short-term in orientation. And, and so they spend most of their time uh, uh, re reacting and firefighting, and uh, that is not a it's not a way to get ahead. And uh, so there is uh, 
uh, some fascinating research on the profitability benefits of being vigilant. And that is that uh, given my definition, the vigilant organizations uh, over time outperform the vulnerable ones by two to one on profit, uh, market cap increase and so forth over a period of seven or eight years. So there's a right. huge reward to uh, seeing sooner and then acting faster. Acting faster, absolutely. So, so that you know uh, brings us into the the digital turbulence that they are facing now. Uh, so, you know, you have been uh, you know watching guiding companies, you know, chronicling the technological shift that you have observed over the decades. Mm -hmm. And how is this current digital turbulence? How has it been different, not only from those technological shifts, but also from, you know, the general economic, social and, uh, you know, uh, shifts that we have all been known. (laughs) So what are the new challenges these leaders are facing? So the the reason for the turbulence uh, and this is a term that uh, Peter Drucker first invoked. Uh, and <laughs> 50 years ago, he wrote a book called The Age of Turbulence. Right. Well, uh, yes. um, I'm a great admirer, long term student of Peter Drucker. And so. It makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, you can't go wrong uh, benchmarking against uh, Peter Drucker. An enormously wise and thoughtful and insightful uh, uh, thinker, uh, but Absolutely. the turbulence that he saw was uh, difficult to deal with. What we've got now, back to your question about digital turbulence in particular, is uh, a uh, confluence of any number of digital technologies. Uh, And uh, so uh, obviously the familiar suspects are anywhere from mobility to uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, uh, internet of Mm -hmm. things. And uh, the fascinating thing though, is not that these technologies aren't advancing on their own, uh, but it's the combinations, the interactions between them. So, when you <clears throat> take artificial intelligence plus sensors plus robots, uh, you've got a uh, entryway for all sorts of new competitors to come in. So uh, Singapore is a hotbed of financial technology startups, and right. they're all nibbling away at the big banks. Uh, and, <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, I, I I gave a, a, a a lecture to a group of life insurance executives yesterday. And uh-huh. uh, uh, they can see that train coming down the track uh, <laughs> because, uh, but, but they, they, we had a deep discussion. I can't go too sure. far into it uh, right. because it's somewhat proprietary, but uh, their perspective was that uh, uh, although uh, Google and Amazon can certainly get into their business. Uh, it would be far better to partner with them because it's a highly regulated sector and uh, it requires extremely deep financial pockets and a long-term perspective. So uh, the I, I, I'm extrapolating here back to the book uh, some of the life insurance companies and insurance companies in general will see that possibility sooner and mm-hmm. uh, start exploring partnerships. And, and by right. acting faster here, <clears throat> they don't have to uh, uh, make a major commitment, but rather right. they have to find and uh, start to inquire and learn about potential partners. So when the time is right, they can engage in that partnership. Whereas the uh, majority of companies will react and uh, they'll decide, oh, we need to uh, partner with a uh, 
a, a big tech company, there isn't a partner available. Available, exactly. So, yeah. so there's so that's, a lot of uh, competitive preemption. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us in yet another episode of Move Conversations. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to the Move Conversations YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications of new episodes. Thank you very much. Till I see you in the next episode. Thank you very much. Have a great day.